Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Coffee and Open Source, a place to meet some new friends, have some great conversations, and maybe learn something along the way. And I'm your host, Isaac Levin. If you're enjoying the interviews here, be sure to like, subscribe, follow wherever you're watching or listening. And also, if you're interested or know any folks that would be interested in coming on and chatting, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. My handle there is IsaacR11, or reach out to me on Mastodon. My handle there is IsaacR11 at Fossadon.org. All right, so with that out of the way, I'm looking forward. This is a big deal for me because I've been a Donna developer my entire career, and I'm talking to one of the quintessential .NET people. So my guest today, Carl Franklin. Do you want to say hello, introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Carl Franklin. <laughs> Introduction done. Done. Next. Awesome. awesome. <laughs> cool. Uh, so for folks who might not know Carl, Carl does a lot of things in the .NET space, uh, hosts a couple of podcasts, does some um, online learning, uh, speaks at conferences, and just generally, like if you've probably been a .NET developer, you've at least heard his name. So, um, but one of the things I, I love to get started before we talk about your your path through .NET and all these sort of different interesting topics is kind of when did your origin story? When did tech com- like present itself to you? When did you realize that tech was something that you wanted to, you know, work on and kind of build a career or a profession around tech? Sure. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I must have been. 10 years old, and uh, my father brought home uh, a TRS-80 Model 4 for the purpose of doing taxes with VisiCalc, mm-hmm. which was the spreadsheet of the day on the Model 4 and just about everywhere else, CPM and everything, before the original IBM P3 
PC got cloned. And uh, he was taking classes for work. So he was an engineer at Electric Boat. He, I still was because he died in 1988. But he, he was an engineer at Electric Boat. And uh, that's where they build nuclear submarines. And they, he took some, you know, they offered him some continuing edu education classes. So he took some computer science classes. And I just remember over breakfast one day, he was sort of telling me the basics of how computers store and retrieve memory, you know, that it's kind of like a neighborhood and every house is like got some storage, some memory in it. Sure. And, you know, you, you have a, everyone has an address. And when you want to, you know, say, put a string together like Carl, you store the C at this neighbor's house and the A at the other neighbor's house and blah, blah, blah. And then you can go deliver the mail. And then you can go retrieve it later. And it was just fascinating to me, you know, the, the way he just had a way of making it sound so uh, understandable and easy and fascinating. And so then I started learning um, basic, you know, on the TRS-80. And that led to getting into the operating system, you know, in batch, file, batch languages. They, they called it something else back then, but it was basically writing batch, batch files to um, string together operating system things. Uh, and, and then, you know, when the original PC got cloned, I got a PC XT clone, you know, and uh, got a copy of Quick Basic. I probably downloaded it and paid for it. No, I didn't pay for it. Uh, <laughs> I probably downloaded it on an on a, on a, uh, illicit bulletin board site or something. Sure, sure. And I just got into it and taught myself. And um, I always had a goal in mind. You know, I wanted to write a bulletin board system because yeah. I had been playing around with modems on the TRS-80 and bulletin boards. And so I had a goal in mind, and I just kept working towards that. And that led to many sleepless nights and bleary uh, mornings, bleary-eyed mornings at my job. And, uh, you know, things went from there. I got into... Uh, basic seven PDS and then visual basic when it came out. And I, I was using tools from Crescent software, which was one of the only tool vendors at the time. And, and um, they were pretty close to me. So, uh, on a summer break from college, I called them up and I said, Hey, I have like all your products. I'm looking for a summer job. What do you got available? They said, do you know this, do you know that, you know, in terms of their products. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah. And they literally said, can you come up for an interview tomorrow? Now, this is really funny because my wife, my first wife, uh, had done four years at UConn with an English degree, and she was shopping her resume yeah. in New York with well, these other places because we were living in New York, and she was getting nowhere, 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 nowhere. And, and I just called up this company. Yeah. Like, hey, come on up. And I literally got the job that day. And 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 she got a job too. And I think I was making like three times what sure. she was sure. in New York at a publisher, you know, doing entry level stuff. And she was just so mad. But um yeah. Yeah. And I mean oh, it it seems to me like that is a story that you could like you could tell today and nobody would kind of disagree mm. with you, right? Like the idea of, you know, I, I don't want to say that it's easier because that's not fair to get a job in tech no. than it is with, than in other disciplines. My but, timing was perfect, yeah, right? I mean, yeah. the PC had recently come out. People were developing software like crazy and there was a real need for software developers and there weren't a whole lot of them. Uh, and then I just got involved with the smart people and they taught me and, you know, I just kept, doing the thing so yeah the timing was great i don't yeah. think that could happen today honestly maybe sure. it could maybe yeah it could. I, th I think it depend depends because i know you know the 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 cli like the economic climate is very interesting right and like sometimes like mm. tech companies will hire everybody for absorbent amounts of money and then other times it's a bit mm -hmm. more challenging to find work in tech but i think in general um you know, if you were to like, if you were to ask somebody like, oh, what's the best degree or what's the best like trade to get into? It's like, oh, computer science, yeah. software engineering, application development, whatever, more mm. so than most, um, you know, social science types of degrees or 
degrees that are built more around like non STEM related activity. Right. I think that's, yeah, all, that's been a right. thing for a while. Um, that's I also, true. I also think in general too, like the, but the interview process I think is a bit more daunting in tech than it probably mm. is in any other industry because of, yeah. you know, obviously there's, that's not a hundred percent true because the medical medicine, medicine industry or mm. the legal industry. Yeah, is, very rigorous. Is, yeah. But like in tech, like the amount of hoops that a lot of people have to jump through to get like even entry level jobs is pretty um, fascinating yeah. to me. I, yeah. One of the things that you mentioned is like, you know, you, it seemed to me like your, your father had a kind of, and a skill that even to this day is still very, very worthwhile. Like the ability to convey messages to people, mm. like in a very simplistic way, like the concept. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think, you know, if he was to, you know, maybe got into the industry a bit earlier, like, could he have been an educator at any point? Do you think he had that sort of level of mm. um, things? And the reason why I ask is because, you obviously have a bit of an education sort of niche, right? So, like, I wonder yeah. if you kind of got that from him. I, I mean, I certainly, that's where it started, you know, yeah. with that conversation. But he was very quiet, soft-spoken. Like, sure. I don't know as if I could see him in front of a class giving a lecture. But, um, but yeah, he his his idea of a good time after work was to come home, you know, sit do the dishes or whatever sit in a chair and read a book until mm. dinner time you know yeah um uh, that that and he just didn't really talk all that much he was a very quiet soft-spoken man but at crescent software ethan weiner was my mentor there he's the guy who started it and he's the kind of guy who to when he was writing a product called pdq which was like revolutionary it was uh, assembly language tools for quick basic um, a standard hello world quick basic uh, applic exe was probably around 30k and he was like stubbing out stuff with the linker and if you used his runtime instead of the quick basic runtime you'd get it down to like 3k sure and that was really important because we only had 640k of memory yeah. in the in the 8-bit address space so you could also do these TSRs, terminate and stay resident programs, which were sort of like the modern day DLL, you know. Anyway, uh, or the the you know the the prototype for for that. Um, anyway, um, so he had he was the kind of guy who would who would get up at three o'clock in the morning and work on his yeah. stuff. You know, and uh, yeah, he had to because that was the only time that he had the quiet in order to to think. But he was also this is the point I wanted to make. He was also such a great teacher, mm -hmm. and not just personal, you know, face to face, but all of their code was commented, and it was real comments. It wasn't like you know, you couldn't just like read. Yeah. The code and figure it out it wasn't just regurgitating what the code said um and not only that but they gave the source code away with all their products and they would have these little tutorial books that they would just drop in you know when they when they e when they mailed you not emailed when they mailed you the product yeah uh you know for introduction to electronics to assembly language you know why and he also wrote for pc magazine uh he was there was a magazine at the time called Basic Pro Magazine, which later turned into Visual Basic Programmers Journal, and the VBits conference and all that stuff was around that. And he pretty much single-handedly launched that magazine, Basic Pro. He was writing most of the content for it when it started. And uh, I remember just it just has a had a very clear, you know, way of describing things and, and so that they were understandable. And he always said stuff, he always defended basic as a language, you know, and and sort of out of the corner of his mouth, sort of uh, made fun of the snooty C developers uh, who were self-righteous because they could, you know, write stuff that you can't even read. <laughs> and, uh, sure, sure, it was yeah. so hard to write C at the time. 
And, you know, he's like, if you want to go low level, just write assembler. You know, it's actually fairly easy. So it was this kind of environment that yeah. I really soaked up all that information yeah. from. So he was he was the teacher mentor, I think, more sure. than my father. Yeah, I, that's quite fascinating because I because, you know, I think it's you talk to people in general in tech and they always remember like that first person that kind of flicked the light. Right. Mm. You know, you have a conversation, you're like, oh, this person's passion, this person's energy, it really resonates with me. Like, I have yeah. a similar story, like my first job, like I happened to just be put with like two people that had like 20 years of software development, one was a O'Reilly published uh, author, and like just mm -hmm. just kind of lived and breathed tech. So like, I kind mm -hmm. of looked at that. And I was like, Oh, like, if you care, like, this is where you can get to like having a pretty, mm -hmm. you know, successful career in it. And that kind of stayed mm -hmm. with me for forever. I think one of the things too, that's very fascinating is like you're talking about all these you know concepts and things at the time that were cutting edge and now you think about what tech is today and you're like oh you know it, it kind of reminds me you have like a college <laughs> professor or you talk to somebody who was a software developer like in the 60s or 70s and they talk about mm. you know punch cards and all of that and you just look at them like how do you get that stuff done and when you say things like 8-bit memory and you know how much address space you have like yeah. how often do you occasionally just kind of think is like how were we able to like be successful at all with like these constraints that computers Dude, had at the time? I thought that yesterday. I mean, <laughs> think about the complexity that is Windows. And yeah. whereas we had one or two layers, you know, of of uh, you know, layers of technology on top of each other, there must be a hundred, hundred and fifty, yeah. two hundred layers between your source code and the the machine code that actually runs yeah. in Windows. I'm surprised sometimes it works at all. Um, yeah. When I worked at <laughs> when I worked at Crescent Software, Don Malin, the vice president, gave me a great quote, and I still use it to this day. And sort of a, an anecdote. He's like, you know, in DOS, right? As a programmer for a DOS program, you're a surgeon. You hook and interrupt, and you have control of that machine, that whole machine until you let it go right sure. so you're like a surgeon you 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 do these precise things you tell it exactly what you want it yeah. to do and it does it and then you let it go he says in windows you're kind of like a psychologist right you have a conversation with the computer yeah, you yeah. you make some suggestions you know you prescribe some medication uh you observe the behavior you know and uh based on the behavior you make a few more suggestions that's yeah. kind of what it's like and that oh, yeah. that has stuck with me ever since yeah and now we're getting to the point where yeah like you actually have conversations with with the software right like you're you, literally having conversations <laughs> yeah yes. it's, pre it's pretty crazy to think about like you know even the last 10 years of tech like some of the, the technologies that have been introduced like you know blockchain technologies uh, container technologies, container orchestration technologies. Mm. And now we're in this, this world of AI where it's like, okay, you like just type in a sentence and it'll do some thing for you. Right. It's pretty, mm. it's pretty fascinating. But like one of the things yeah. that I, one of the things I always think about too, if you think about being in tech 10 years ago or 15 years ago, at least in, in my, it's like in my world, the, the problems aren't any different really like the tools change, but the problems are always the same. You work at a company, yeah. you have some data source, you want to have some UI, whether it be a website or a client app or whatever that just interacts with that data source. Right. Yeah. And we have all these different technologies to make that more scalable or resilient or all these sort of things. Mm. But here's a question for you. Like if you actually thought about it, like when was the last time you had a problem that was so like there was that, you realize the only reason why you had this problem is because the tools exist to help you solve the problem. The only reason you have the problem is because there are tools that will solve the problem. Yeah. And mm. well, I think the opposite is true. Sometimes I have a problem and there's no tool or API to solve it. And generally that's, when you're talking about some sort of third party service and they expose sure. an API and they don't expose the thing that you need them to. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't think I ever, I mean, I'd be curious as to what 
example is in your mind when you ask yeah. that question? I think about things like, you know, container orchestration specifically to me. And I, I joke mm -hmm. all the time about Kubernetes. It's like, you know, do we need Kubernetes or do we just need something else that isn't Kubernetes, right? And I don't need to dive into this topic too deeply, but I think a lot mm -hmm. of people see Kubernetes as like the first thing and then they find something that they can build with Kubernetes. That's kind of my point. Is like oh 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 yeah. I see. So we have a you we have a tool. How can we use it? Yeah yeah. yeah. Or, well, that's not a it's not at all a bad approach to problem solving because it may open your eyes to things that you can do that you didn't know you could do. Um, and I find that was it was true in music too. I remember yeah. the one of the first real keyboards that I bought was a Korg M1, and it had so many different sounds on it. And the first thing I did is I went through and listened to all the samples and all the sounds and and thought to myself, what could I make with these sounds, right? Just like you go to a grocery store and you see yeah. what's good and you, and you get some ingredients and then you say, what can I make with these ingredients? So yeah, I think, I think that can be a good path to discovering mm -hmm. uh, things that you didn't know you could do. Yeah. I think my point, and I totally agree with, and I love the music anecdote because I think, you know, if folk, folks that are watching this, like Carl is in, you know, folks that aren't watching this, Carl is in front of a very illustrious music studio that he has spent copious amounts of time putting together. Um, mm. But like the idea that, you, you know, we're looking for opportunities to like use a tool that we think might be valuable to solve some problem. Mm. But my response to that is a bit, some people use, like they see everything, they're a hammer and everything's a nail. Yep, I get so it. That's that, that approach, sure. right? Um, but I think one of the things that's interesting to me, and this is the reason why I kind of want, want to go down this, this conversation area, is, you know, when did you realize that tools was probably the, if not, if not the, one of the top two or three things needed for you to really be successful in tech. Because a lot yeah. of people think that like, oh, you know, to be a developer, you have to memorize all these things or whatever. It's like, no, you just have to be very good with the tools. Well, I realized the importance of tools, certainly from an economic standpoint when I was working at Crescent, because they were all yeah. very aware that, you know, we don't have to write the software and sell the software. We write the building blocks that software developers use to write the software. And that's a much safer business model than, you know, actually let's put a startup together and write the next software that somebody's going to use. Right. Sure. Um, you know, you, you have the subscription model and you have the always updating stuff and you have repeat customer uh, purchases. So yeah, I, I found the value of tools when I worked for them and then literally immediately started writing tools of my own immediately. Yeah. Um, and that has been, yeah, that writing sort of little plumbing things for my own purposes has kept me sane throughout my entire career. Um, that's, that's great. I just did another I one. one. I, I just did another one today. Uh, with the help of ChatGPT, which is fabulous for uh, writing code with. Uh, it, it basically, there are all these services out there where you can upload a background picture, like a JPEG file, and then a, a WAV file or an MP3 file, and it will superimpose like a wave on top. I was like, come on, there's got to be a way to do this in C Sharp, you know? Sure, Turns sure, out sure. FFmpeg has a has a thing that does that. So I yeah. basically spent three hours with ChatGPT going through and getting, you know, t tweaking this program. And now I have something that I can just run at the command line and it works great. And I'm using it to uh, make little um, viral videos to uh, advertise security this week, which is one of the podcasts that I do. And I'll probably use it for .NET Rocks and other things, too. It, it like, so you kind of hit something that is very near and dear to my heart is like the idea of like building something that like, that solves a problem for me mm -hmm. and then realizing very, very quickly, like, oh, this is probably a problem for everybody. Mm. And I think there's a very small subset of, of people that build things in tech that that is their area of interest. Like right. the, the building tools for people. 
Because everybody like thinks, oh, I'm gonna go to some insurance company or I'm gonna go to Netflix or I'm gonna and I'm gonna build like the thing that everybody uses. Yeah. But then there's a smaller subset of folks that are like, I just want to build the tools that make those people more successful. Yeah. And like you talked about a little bit with the, you know, your your, you know, historical talking about the cre- the crescent stuff. Mm. You know, the 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 building of tools is so impactful. Yeah. It's in my opinion, building tools is more impactful than shipping netflix or shipping whatever product or whatever software yeah. or whatever application that end users end up using right think about the elation that we all felt the first time we ran dot net and the framework and the base class library and how it had all these yeah. things in it like system.io right uh has all these great things with streams and yeah. file loading files and things and then you know when json comes around uh, serialization back and forth. Like, it's just, it, you know, you, I don't know. I, I just love using these things because they're yeah. so freaking easy to use and so powerful. Um, and uh, like I said before, I, I, my first thought is to write a tool for myself. And if, you know, I, and I have a lot of things, a lot of demos on my GitHub account mostly because of uh, blazer train but then and there's stuff out there like there's no license i don't have an mit license i just yep. put it out there for a demo that goes along with the video and if somebody wants to take that and and you know use it and modify it and make their own thing i don't care you know I, there should be an i don't care license you know <laughs> well isn't that kind of what like the uh, what is the is one like that. Is it, that's MIT, right? Like so. the do with it as you wish yeah. sort of license, right? Um, yeah, like I, so. I, I, it's funny that you mentioned like licensing stuff. Like I, I interviewed Jeff Strauss on my show, and, and we both know Jeff. Mm-hmm. Um, he like he used to be a lawyer, so we talked a, a little bit about like the legality around um, a, a software licensing. It is kind kind of fascinating, but like the idea, it's like yeah, just like on four or five sentences. You can di- you can be- differentiate whether this is like anybody can use it for whatever they want, mm-hmm. or if you touch this and modify it, you get sued. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's 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 quite crazy, like how the entire software industry is built on these like primitives of like, oh, like you need to follow this particular license, or you're gonna get whacked, sort of thing. Yeah, you know what industry is even worse? The music industry. Which one? Oh, well, we can go into a whole tirade about music in general. Oh, my God. I, well, it's not so much now because, you know, it used to be that when you made a YouTube video, you had to get consent from everybody in the video. And now people go to yeah. concerts and they pan across the crowd and nobody cares. Right? Yeah. So, um, you know, you you play a cover song and you put it up on YouTube and you get a warning that says, hey, there's a copyright claim on this. You don't have to do anything, but just so you know, Somebody could yeah. come around and demand that you take it down. Um, but in the in the 60, 50s, 60s, and 70s, man, the copyright and, and all that stuff. Bootlegs, yeah. And bootlegs, like you would you could find yourself doing some hard time, you know. As not and nothing like software. I mean, software, of course, it's all so it's all about people making money, right? If oh, if sure. I my band, you know, we do a lot of Steely Dan tunes. So we got videos up there of us playing a Steely Dan song. We have, you know, a couple thousand views. Nobody, mm-hmm. you know, nobody cares. But if we started getting like a million views and the money yep. started rolling in for monetization, you know, Donald Fagan would be like, yo, Carl, you got to stop that yeah. or pay yeah. us some of this money. Right. And so it's the same yeah. in software. Yeah. Right. I would feel bad. Maybe I would, maybe I wouldn't. But if somebody took something that I wrote and just put up on GitHub and then took it and modified it and made their own thing and sold it and created a company around it, I'd be like, well, I guess, you know, it's a double-edged sword. I'd be kind of like, whoa, maybe I should go ask for some of that. But then it's, you know, that's the easy part, creating it. The hard part is, is selling it, marketing it, putting your company around, taking big risk, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't want to do any of that. So, so it's just fine. Yeah. Yeah. But you do appreciate and I, and I, and I just wanted to like, just double click into this. Like you do appreciate the folks. Some people care about that very yes, much. Yes, they do. Right? Yeah. 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 Because I think one of the things that I struggle with in tech all the time is like you, 
everybody is consumers of open source, mm-hmm. right? Or somebody's GitHub repo. Like even, you know, if you look at the dependency stack all the way down, everybody's dependent on, you know, pad left or like some other like silly story, right? Sure. Where every single person, but, but the thing is that when we come from like a sponsorship or an appreci- even appreciation perspective, yeah. we only go like one or two levels down, yeah. right? Yeah. So like, you know, you know, to take your, to your example, like, oh, I'm going to serialize JSON, right? Like, so I'm going to take advantage of either Microsoft's approach or, you know, James Newton King's approach. Mm-hmm. And that's great. Which are the same he, thing now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Well, different conversation yeah, yeah. for a different day. Right. Um, but if, like, but you appreciate that, like, oh, I'm, I'm consuming this NuGet package yeah. without really thinking about like, oh, those packages take dependencies and other packages and right. someone and the turtles all the way down. And it, it is quite fascinating to me is like all of tech is like built on the work of like, you know, to kind of go back to, uh, five minutes in this conversation, mm-hmm. like, Hey, Carl just wanted to like, you know, superimpose like some waves on some like wave file on top of a background. Mm. And now it's being used by like the biggest tech stack in the world. Right. Right. Yeah. It's, it's an, it's a fascinating your thought experiment. Yes. Right? And Especially and I realize that. that I realize that people who do real open source projects, you know, where they put hours and hours and hours and planning yeah. and stuff into something, they should be compensated somehow and at sure. least, you know, yeah. have a license model that works for them to, to recoup some of their costs. But, you know, for me, uh, it's a totally different thing. So yeah, I, I get it. And I, and I, and, you yeah. know, on .NET rocks, Richard and I, have been talking to people. Uh, I think it started with David Whitney and mm-hmm. Andy C. Oslo last year, where you know we were talking about that. How do how do open source project, uh, you know, how do how do open source uh, people? What's the word I want? You know, the the people who put out the maintainers, the maintainers yeah, the creators and the yeah. maintainers. How do they recoup all the time? you know, an effort that they put into that monetarily. And so that that's a big to- hot topic in the last year. Yeah, I've been thinking about this a lot too, probably because I, you know, whenever I listen to, you know, ever it seems like at least in the last six months or nine months or so, like you you folks, you know, Carl, you know, you and Richard, mm. like have been doing Don and Rocks episodes around open source sustainability, which I think is absolutely yeah. awesome that you're kind of making that platform. And you've been interviewing folks like, you know, Sean Walker or Jimmy Bogart Mm -hmm. or like these people that like have like very well established, you know, open source communities. And I've been thinking more and more about this because, you know, you and I, we travel in similar circles. We, we know similar people. It's like the Jeremy Millers of the world or Sean specifically, like Mm. they've been able to kind of make a career to some extent, like on open source Mm -hmm. and, but you talk to them and they're like, well, it's, it's not like, it's, it's kind of a lot of work. But like once you get once you actually figure out how the business model works and how you're gonna be able to pay your mortgage, mm. it's it's substantially more fulfilling. Yeah, and then if you think of the identity server guys, you know. Oh sure, yeah. That that is a whole different story and a unique story, yeah. but uh, it didn't come without pain. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, I think there's gonna be pain whenever you, whenever you know to to quote you know, our friend Scott Hansman, like whenever you move somebody's cheese, like people are going to get angry. Right. Right. Like, (laughs) and it's, it's always fascinating to me. Like, you know, we're, we're in tech and we see all these arguments on online about different things. And it's literally just about just a little bit of change. Mm -hmm. Right. Like all these arguments are just about some sort of change that people don't appreciate. Right. Right. And depending on who you are, that change is something, whatever. Right. But it's, it's fascinating. Is something is like this person who makes little to no money and built this thing from the goodness of their own heart to better the community because they probably had a problem and they realize that other people might have problems. Yeah. They're going to change the API a little bit mm-hmm. or heaven forbid, they want to like charge money to people who make, who use their software in a commercial sense. Like heaven forbid they make a little bit of money. Right. And now they're like, you know, now we're all communists and like <laughs> we all read the, the communist manifesto. And we're all huge fans of Karl Marx. <laughs> but it's it, it just seems to me how fascinating like some people's thought processes around. I'm gonna voice my frustrations online about this. I've been wronged as an individual. Mm-hmm. Yeah, first world yeah. problems. Yeah. Sure, sure. Hey, at well, least I mean, you can eat. We're in tech, all right. 
Yeah, we're in tech. We're in tech. We all that's all we care about is first world problems. Right, of course. Um to, to kind of circle back to, you know, I want to talk a little bit about some of the thing like so to kind of go along your your journey in tech, right? So mm-hmm. you're you're working, you're building tools for developers and mm-hmm. you know, the early the early ages of 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 like I guess more consumer-based software usage mm-hmm. and you know, 90s rolls around dot com shins up like i'd like to hear mm-hmm. your thoughts about like the initial like feeling around dot com because whenever you talk to people they're like oh it was insane like everybody's making money there's plethora of opportunities but whenever i talk to people they don't realize or at least they don't have the maybe they don't have the hindsight to think about like oh like this is not a sustainable model like when did you realize mm-hmm. that dot like the dot com boom was going to be something that wasn't going to end the way that everybody expected it to be wow great question um i specifically remember because i've been early to everything every sort of trend and uh, i've always been an early adopter and so i remember building a website for a company in new york where we were using uh sql server 6 on the back end and a classic asp yep you know we had no idea how or if it could scale. You know, it's before .NET. You know, it was like VB script in ASP. Um, there weren't really any tools to try to figure that out. We just had to, you know, bus our way through it. We knew how to scale SQL Server, and we knew that was the big bottleneck. But also, there wasn't. The uh, this idea of you know using as many static files as possible so you don't have to hit that server as much. We were certainly using caching in ASP, but um, I, I found that it was just difficult at the beginning to meet the expectations of customers. Mm. It was very difficult, you know, and especially if you had success. If you had success, the last thing a customer wants to hear is. Oh, you need to, you know, buy hundred thousand dollars more worth of more gear, and we need a farm, sure. and we need a cluster, and this and that. You know, that's the last thing they want to hear. But unfortunately, that's that's what it took. That's what it takes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what it took back then. And you know, the cloud, we just like grab a dial and move it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean. Yeah. So you know, and then once after like. You know, dot the dot the the bust happens. We start to you know restabilize. Like dot net comes out. You mm. know that then you know the the idea of like building things in the web becomes a bit more you know accessible to a lot of folks. Then JavaScript right. technologies come out. Like we're going through all these trends, and the reason why I kind of I'm bringing them up, yeah, is it's fascinating to me when I talk with folks that, you know, I'm a little bit younger, so I don't remember specifically .com. It's at least in a professional sense, like .com, and then, you know, introduction of JavaScript frameworks and, like, the the, mm. the big thing. Like, when did you, like, what are some of the things that you've seen as we've gone through these different moments in tech? That, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I can, I can talk to that. So, uh, you know, before .NET, we were using you know, classic ASP, yeah. Internet and Information Server for web stuff. We had, you know, Windows, not Windows Forms, it was just VB, right? To build Windows applications was the way to do it. And then, uh, you know, when .NET came out, it was, first of all, like I said before, the, you know, l- learning what was in the base class library and the stuff you could do was really, really amazing. And so it was like, wow, we have all this support, you know, all this plumbing code I never have to do again. Sure. Uh, I don't have to use reference count, reference counting. Like uh, it, we had a hard time wrapping our minds around the dispose pattern, uh, disposable, because we were using com interop, and that was the primary reason that you would want to do that. But um, the .NET framework was primarily a Windows framework. Sure. It's not what it is today. Yeah. Well, the .NET framework still exists, but that's all we had. It was definitely a a, a Windows-based thing. And speaking uh, as the the podcaster, .NET Rocks, 
our main advertisers sold programming tools, yep. just like I was talking about at Crescent, but programming tools for .NET to .NET developers, and they were primarily Windows tools. So these yeah. were corporations that had big budgets and could spend, you know, thousand dollars a month or whatever on subscriptions for these tools. So these companies were making a lot of money basically from all they had to do is just get the word out, right? Yeah, so the podcast yeah. came around at a time when the internet was very pop, very popular mm -hmm. and more people were getting the information from the internet than they were from magazines, which magazines were the core way that developers learned about new technologies before the internet. Paper, I know, it's a yeah, right. crazy, crazy thought. Crazy. But, but the problem was once relevant information started appearing online um, and you then you get your magazine and you look through the magazine and you already know this stuff because you read it online, right? Because that was two months ago somebody wrote this. That's how long it takes the cycle to get a magazine out. So I remember what tool companies were paying for ads in those magazines because I worked at a tool company. Yep. And I knew that they were charging a lot of money, these magazines, for full-page ads and half-page ads. So when it looked like there were no more magazine advertising, advertising opportunities for these tool vendors, they, you know, the smart ones looked around and they said, well, podcasts are yeah. kind of a cool way. And, you know, the, a couple of them glommed on to .NET Rocks because we were like the biggest .NET podcast, the only .NET podcast. Yeah at one point so we sort of rode that wave right so there was the windows wave mm -hmm. then i distinctly remember when all the javascript toolkits came out it wasn't like companies gave up their windows development right sure. but they were trying to figure out how to use these javascript frameworks with the web with mvc to do web versions of their you know behind the firewall corporate stuff that yep. they were using even WPF for and Windows Forms for. So slowly that eroded away at the revenue of these uh, companies because let's face it, when you have a binary toolkit with DLLs for Windows that you sell, you know, th those are very hard to do and they require constant updating and all yep. that stuff. But the JavaScript world is online. It's yeah. open source yeah. and people share and the innovation is happening with, you know, some 20 year old kid who uh, after school or whatever is writing stuff and putting it up there and everybody's using it. And so yeah. these tool companies had a hard time building up JavaScript based tools and yeah. selling JavaScript based tools. So that really came to a head, I'm going to say, in 2011, 2012. And that's sort of when, you know, these advertisers pulled out of .NET Rocks. Mm. And then, you know, with Azure becoming very uh, relevant, the advertisers that we got. And so the, from, from the lens of advertisers, that tells me about what companies are making money on yeah. things that they want to sell to developers, right? So the advertiser, advertisers we got were for, you know, uh, telemetry tools sure. that you could use yeah. in the cloud, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And we even had, you know, Amazon was a, was a, did some advertising. Uh, and I think you were part of that, yeah. um, putting that together. Uh, Google Cloud did some advertising with us. Um, so, yeah, so that trend was clear because mm -hmm. it affected our bottom line, yeah. which, you know, sort of affected our personal lives because sure. this was our job. Yeah. yeah. And we had to reinvent. And I would say that um, I was I was not a fan of doing work as a software developer in Angular and Knockout. And I did a yeah. few projects and knockout and i did one in angular and uh i just was not a fan i you know so then when blazer came around i was like oh thank god <laughs> sure. thank 
God. And yeah. thanks, Steve Sanderson. Yeah. I th- every time I see him, I saw him in Porto at breakfast. I just said, dude, just got to say thank you. Yeah. <laughs> You're killing it. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's like the, the Steve thing. The Steve thing is quite fascinating to me. And for folks that might not get the context, Steve Sanderson is an engineer at Microsoft too. He built, for instance, if you've ever heard of Knockout JS, he was the person that built Knockout JS, um, which is at the top, you know, for a point in time was like one of the most popular JavaScript frameworks. And then he kind of he rewrote the Azure portal in Knockout JS. Yes. Yes. So right. he's got a lot of experience with binding models and things. Yeah. And then he, you know, you know, put his efforts into building a, basically a way to run .NET in the browser. And, you know, that's now a product that um, is a part of .NET called Blazor, which um, mm. I like to talk about Blazor because I think you, at least in my opinion, you're one of the definitive Blazor experts. You, at least you've kicked it enough to know a lot about it, right? And, yeah, I, like I said, I was, I was early. I'm always yeah, early, yeah. early to Blazor too. Yeah, and one of the things yeah. I love to talk about specifically with Blazor, we don't need to spend a ton of time on it, is like, mm-hmm. you know, when did you realize this is the thing? And for folks that might not be as tapped into .NET, like Blazor is starting to be introduced in a bunch of different modalities, right? Initially, it was just like building web apps. And then it was like, okay, like web apps and then maybe desktop apps too. Like you can maybe host a, a Blazor web app inside of yeah. um, a web, um, like a, a client app, like for Windows. And now it's kind of, oh, now we're going to build uh, ang- uh, Android apps and iOS apps, but in Blazor or at least have a Blazor mm-hmm. web app in them. Like, when did you realize, like, okay, this Blazor thing is kind of taking over, like, .NET user interfaces? The first aha moment was when I read the WebAssembly spec, mm-hmm. and and then I went looking at support for WebAssembly, and one by one, all the browsers started picking yeah. it up, and I was like, okay. And once I understood that, what WebAssembly was, and that the only interface to the DOM that WebAssembly has, it's a virtual machine that runs in the browser, right? So it's protected, it's walled off, and the only way that it can access the DOM is through JavaScript. Yeah. Now, JavaScript is already sandboxed, so there's no way that WebAssembly could reach into JavaScript and say, hey, format the C drive. You know, sure, there's no way sure. that that's going to happen, or, or go, you know, itemize the things in the documents folder or whatever. You can't do that uh, because JavaScript can't do it. And once I saw the significant support in every major browser, that's when I was like, okay, well, that's it. Yeah. But that was just for WebAssembly. The, th- the first Blazor that I got a hold of was Blazor Server, which came out in .NET yeah. Core 3. And I got a hold of the beta. And uh, the component model, the component model, like how you do binding, how you pass, how you create components and isolate them and, and the cascading support and all the things that they did in the component model, which were just so elegant, um, that is what really blew me away. So the two things together, like WebAssembly is great because people want to r- run C Sharp in the browser and WebAssembly is supported everywhere, great, no problem. But now, in actually writing that code, we have a, th- we have a thing, and then WebAssembly came later, we have now the ability to take the same code yep. and run it where all the UI interaction happens on the server or runs on the client completely. And you know, so that was the next wow moment. And I think for me, uh, that sustained my enthusiasm all the way up to .NET 8. Yeah. And seeing how .NET 8 for Blazor changes everything, it's almost as if, I mean, all that stuff is there that if you want to use MVC with Angular, it's all there, and nobody's saying you shouldn't do that. But if you were going to create a Greenfield application, a brand new project for web, any kind of web app, there is no reason that you shouldn't be using a Blazor web app sure. template in Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code or whatever, because, because you can do everything that MVC can do. You know, you can just serve static data if you want to. You can use, you know, APIs 
uh, ABI controllers and have JavaScript frameworks if you want to. But then if you want to take advantage of Blazor interactivity, you can just sort of sprinkle it wherever you want yeah. and by at the component level. And uh, it changes everything. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I think, similar to you when I first saw sort of the initial prototypes, I was like, okay, well, I'm never going to touch a JavaScript framework again. Like, yeah. I mean, not to <laughs> knock anybody who built, who has made a career either building JavaScript frameworks or building applications that use JavaScript frameworks. I'm just a .NET developer and I want to use as much .NET in my job as possible. Um, so like, it's a personal choice. Well, and you think, said it. You, you yeah. don't want to touch a JavaScript framework. Yes. But we still yeah. have to use JavaScript in some respect oh, sure. and some I, sometimes i yeah. was having this conversation with somebody the other day about jquery specifically and like mm. i still think jquery is like still the best way to like change things like the 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 interactivity and the way that you build things with jquery and, and operate against the dom with jquery at least in my opinion is still the best way to do it because well, it's it, not in your it, face yeah it's not in your face the problem with jQuery is, well, it's sort of solved the problem that is now solved. Yes. The problem was the browser DOM models were all different. Yeah. And so it sort of abstracted all that away, you know, so people didn't want to write, you know, if we're on Chrome, do this routine, yeah. call this yeah. function. Yeah. And if we're on, uh, you know, IE, but um, yeah, the jQuery, wow. It, it really was revolutionary at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one of the things specifically about Blazor that I've really appreciated is I think a lot of people are similar to to you and me that they saw Blazor as this okay, like this is the next wave of thing that we should look to adopt. So you see mm. all these this open source like components that are being built, component yep. vendors are building really great rich interactivity interactive experiences. You're seeing all this yeah. content that people are creating. And the reason why I bring that up is I, because you specifically like you've created tons of content around blazer and mm -hmm. you know you've been i think in my opinion you've been very successful in getting the message out there like blazer is the thing if you're a .NET developer and yeah. i remember you know it, it we talked about this a bit like i'm a pretty um avid listener of your uh podcast show .NET rocks and you, mm -hmm. you you talked about this uh code in a castle Right, like where you take yeah. people and you're going to teach them the latest in Blazor, the latest in .NET, but it's kind mm -hmm. of like a, uh, a an ex an experience sort of conference or experience. I coined sort the of term. Learning. Yeah, I coined the term traincation. Traincation. Oh, very traincation. good. Very good. I, I like yes. to talk a little. I like to talk a little bit about that, if you don't mind. Sure. So I have a friend in New York who's been a .NET Rocks listener for a long time. Lives in New York City. And uh, we've been friends for a while. And he says, hey, I'm going to be passing through. I'd like to have lunch. Okay. So we go out to lunch. He says, I got this crazy idea that I want to create an experience that's both training and a vacation and yep. encourage developers to bring their significant others uh, to a castle. And this is a place that you can't just, it's not a hotel. You can't just say, hey, I'd like call up and say, I'd like a room. You know, it, they don't do that. Yeah. They rent to groups and you rent the whole castle and it comes with a chef and it comes with, you know, cleaning service and all that stuff. But you have to have a group and you have to have, buy so many rooms mm -hmm. and, and the, you know, you have to have so many rooms. So, yeah, man, it was just amazing. It was this castle in Tuscany in the Marema area. Um, which is sort of the Tuscan Riviera, you know, and uh, we had just enough people to make it worthwhile. Um, it wasn't cheap, you know. It was upwards of 10 grand for, you know, a, a person and their significant other to come and stay for a week. We were in class for four days a day. It turned into 24, six days a week, so 24 hours of training turned out it was the perfect amount of time but yeah. from nine to one uh we're in class sitting around a table and i'm teaching and the spouses are off with this italian guy who knows tuscany taking them for different experiences that yeah. only they have 
and then we meet up after one o'clock uh, you know for lunch somewhere and then go do some other activity all together and then we're out until you know probably 10 o'clock at night doing things and uh, enjoying tuscany so it was literally a, a a training vacation a traincation and it was a huge hit people loved it yeah yeah, yeah that's so that's, we're gonna do it again that's absolutely fascinating to me because as somebody who has been an attendee at conferences and obviously i've been a speaker at conferences as well like there's nothing that like the idea that oh like there's stuff to do like outside of the conference that's attached to the conference is more of the main mm -hmm. reason why i go like you know, we were talking about, for instance, like NDC or some of these other big conferences in Europe or Dev Intersection, mm -hmm. big conferences in the US, right? Mm -hmm. Like part of the reason why I like going is because the organizers of the conference put like effort into like, oh, there's more than just learning here. Right. There's more than just like, I guess, typical like networking here. There's excursions, mm -hmm. quote unquote, or there's activities that everybody can get together and just like enjoy each other's company which i think is really important yeah I, and i mean here's a question for you mm. who do you think had a better time at this particular event was it the 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 people that were doing the training or the spouses well i was the only one doing the training oh you mean oh 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 yeah so like taking the training yeah, uh, yeah. they both did i mean it was equally yeah. enjoyable for for everyone um but I'll tell you what, I I asked the spouses, and did you miss them when you were going? And no, no, they didn't. Sure. No. Maybe for a second until, you know, I'm talking. I'm, not at you know, all. No, it was not at all. Wine, hey, eating yeah, the I best know, right? food, right? Like, I missed them for a second, <laughs> but then I got over it. Yeah, I got over yeah. it real quick, right? Yeah, and, that's and of great. Course, of course, the training was great. So the, the, the people doing the training loved it. Um, so, yeah, it, it was it was just good for both and i also asked the question um i have a little promo video for it i can give you a link to sure but i asked the question you know if it was just training would you have come and you know the answer was no because yeah. just to go to spend that amount of money on oh, training sure. and yeah. and without you know your your significant other and doing all these other things it, it's not worth it but if they can turn it into a vacation you know, in a place that they'd never be able to yeah. afford or even it's not even available to them. It has yeah. to be done in a group. Yeah. So that that's the value. Yeah. So I, so obviously you've done Tuscany. So like, would you do mm. would would you like to continue? You don't need to kind of if you have some ideas, you don't need to spoil them here. But like, I'd imagine that there are experiences like this that are probably all over the world. All over like, the world, yeah. Not specifically to Tuscany, but like, have you started to think like, oh, okay, maybe yep. there's an opportunity like this in, you know, uh, you know, you mentioned the Riviera, like, oh, maybe there's a place like this in France, or maybe there's a place like yeah, this in the, Ireland, or as a matter of fact, uh, Larry is thinking the south of France might be the next, yeah, um, the next thing. Yeah. yeah, I think like you know, when I think of castles, I think of you know, like the United Kingdom or Ireland, mm -hmm. right? Like, oh, there's probably Germany, Ireland, yeah, Scotland. Yeah. Yeah, so there's probably tons of like places that do something similar to this, and you just have to figure yeah. out like how does it work? Like, or well, we we need a room to do, you know, 24 hours of training, and I imagine they probably yeah. accommodate. Yeah, uh, it, that's so fascinating to me, and I think as somebody who was actually delivering the training, did you feel <laughs> like there was anything that I'm trying to, and I'm trying to phrase this a particular way? Like, do you feel like do you feel like the attendees got something out of it like they might have said oh, yes yeah. but yeah you think like from oh, a training yeah. perspective yeah one guy told me that and he was from germany he's this german guy but he also spoke italian and english sure you know pure all european, Europe, you all european speak speaks Greek. six languages yeah it's crazy i know yeah it's crazy uh so he told me this was the best training i've ever had oh and I and he's he was an older guy and he's been around in IT for a long time. And I said, really, are you just saying that? He goes, no. He said, because you didn't burden us with exercises that we're going to yeah. take time and do exercises now like you. And and you weren't required to to type along, you know, yeah. um, 
you just saw how these apps were put together and then you could take the materials and go home and go through them and study them but but that's what he said and uh yeah. I'll, I'll never forget it yeah that's great i think too like you know and not to knock the the, the traditional conference but it is a lot mm. to ask of people like mm -hmm. to be tuned in for you know if you're doing a workshop all day eight hours if you're doing like sessions it's mm. you know four or five sessions a day you know and you're putting a lot of you know a lot of emotion like mental capital into it yeah. right and the yeah. idea is like oh we're gonna do four hours like that's to me is substantially more attainable because it's time boxed mm -hmm. and then you get to go you know reset and all those sort of things uh yeah. I think like it's interesting because you know we were talking a little bit earlier about big tech conferences and you know the challenges these days with the economic climate and all of that. Like, mm -hmm. could you imagine if like one of these tech tech organizers were like we're gonna do something similar to this? We're gonna take everybody and we're gonna go, you know, rent a cabin in Tahoe or rent mm -hmm. something in Tahoe, right? Like, and we're gonna do something similar to that. Do you think? that there's any sort of model for that, like not one off like what you did, but like at, at some sort of scale? No. And the reason I say no is because one of the, one of the things that was great about this event was that there was only six people in the class. Yeah. There, you know, when you get more than that, logistics become hard. I mean, we're, we're taking cars, to go into town and to go have dinner at a restaurant. You don't do that with a hundred people. Yeah. You know? So that's what I that's why I say no. And that, and also Tahoe, for example, is a place that anybody can go. Sure. Right yeah. now and, you know, pay for a good experience. And that's fine. But the as I said before, the thing that made this really work was it was an experience that you you didn't have access to. The, exclus the exclusivity of it. Yeah. And, yeah. and I mean, think about it. When you walk around a castle and you just like walk across a circular lawn down to where the pool is and there's nobody there. Yeah. Like you are the only 10 people that are there and not everybody's there all the time. So I'm mean, walking around. is just like, oh, my God, this is like where I'm where I'm hanging out this week. Yeah. It's private, it's exclusive, and it's something that you wouldn't have been able to do otherwise because you, you can't just rent a room in this castle, as yeah. I said before. That's, I mean, that's that's fascinating. And I think, yeah, mm. you know, please let me know when you want to do another one of these things and I'll be sure oh, to yes. share it with everybody I know because, I mean, I'll even try to convince my wife, like, hey, we should just do this. Like, uh, like well, Scott Hunter almost came. Oh, wow. He I, did, but he couldn't make his schedule work. Oh wow! But he, well, he was so that would be great. To it. Yeah, this this is great. Yeah. I mean, this is I I love the idea of figuring out like unique ways to like teach people things. And I think mm. there's tons of different mediums. And now we have castle based training as an opp as a <laughs> as a yeah. as an opportunity as well, which is great. You know, yeah. and I think that's the the a good way to to end the conversation. I we've been talking for a while, and I really appreciate you coming on and talking to me about, you know, the history of tech that you've seen, some of the things that the things that you've seen that are similar, some of the things that are different and and how you go about, you know, detecting whether or not tech is, you know, something a particular area of tech is something to really attach to. And I really appreciate mm. it. Uh, and, you know, as we wrap up, I do like to ask my guests like one final question. And it's probably the hardest sure. one, so I apologize. Um so, like, if you could think about the conversation we've had, we've been talking for an hour about a whole different sway of topics in, in tech, right? And if you could think about those things, the community around tech, open source and tech, sustainability and tech, but you had one word to kind of describe that feeling that you had, or maybe two words, what would those be for you, Carl? The feeling that I had when? That just in general, like, when you think about the things we've talked about over the last hour. Oh. Oh, uh, Satisfaction. Yeah. Satisfaction. Um, I've, I've been very lucky, you know, and I still am to have gotten into it when I did to have uh, had the foresight to reinvent my career a couple of times by being early to something and really diving into it. 
and um, just, you know, lucky. I, I guess I was lucky, but success is a bunch of, a combination of things, right? You have to have some luck, but you also have to have good timing and a lot of hard work. Yeah. You know? And one thing that's great about Satisfaction is that it's also a great song. It is. <laughs> By a and band that just released a new album. I, I saw that. I need to listen to it. Like, I saw... I saw a video with Keith Richards and I'm like, how is this guy still playing guitar so well? How's he um, still alive? I don't know. Different conversation <laughs> for a different day. I think um, <laughs> this has been great. I really appreciate it, Carl. Um, for folks that want to, you know, if you're not already following Carl, Carl you can find him on uh, Mastodon. So Carl Franklin at techhub.social. There'll also be some mm -hmm. links down below to, to take a look at some of the things that Carl's doing, obviously .NET rocks and security and blazer train and all these other sort of things that he's doing. We'll be sure to link to those out before we sign off. Do you have any parting words, my friend? Uh, just be awesome. That's my general advice to anybody, you know, whatever you're going to do, be the best at it that you can possibly be good. I can't dis I cannot disagree with that like being positive being awesome is the way to go so i appreciate Absolutely. your time and thank you for everybody thank tuning you. in and listening to this in the future this is isaac levin from coffee and open source i hope you enjoy the rest of your day take care